Good afternoon, I'm Giovanni Dennis with the Midday News for Monday, November 16. A special welcome if you're watching online at onespotmedia.com. The Puerto Buena Mountains, also known as the Dry Harbor Mountains in St. Anne, remains the center of an environmental dispute. Chairman of the Jamaica Environment Trust, Jet, Diana McCauley, has been speaking out against the government's decision to allow quarrying and mining in the area. Mrs. McCauley appeared on TVJ Smile Jamaica this morning. The details in this report. Last week, Prime Minister Andrew Holness announced that the government was sticking to its decision to permit mining in the Dry Harbor Mountains in St. Anne. Mr. Holness reasoned that the decision was made on the basis that mining is an economic driver for sustainable development. But Chairman of the Jamaica Environment Trust, Jet Diana McCauley, believes otherwise. Well, I think it's a big mistake to frame it in that way, as if the two things are in opposition and we can have one and not the other and we must choose. Because, of course, we want economic development and, and we understand that the COVID situation has made you know, has presented many more threats than happened before, than, than existed before. But the question is, <clears throat> excuse me, not, not should we mine at all, but where should we mine? Mm -hmm. Not only does she disagree, but Mrs. McCauley adds that the government's decision is a breach of a planning framework. And we have two planning frameworks that govern this kind of thing. One is a development order, which this project is in breach of. And the other is quarry zones, which are done under the Quarries Control Act, which is where mining quarrying is supposed to take place. And this is not a quarry zone either. So I'm totally opposed to breaching planning frameworks. The Dry Harbor Mountain is one of the areas identified to be conserved as a forest. Mrs. McCauley says forests are important, especially in the fight against the impact of climate change on the island. And our forests in a very way, real way protect us from the ravages of the climate crisis, which mm -hmm. is already on us, sure. you know, because they, they filter water, they protect, protect flooding, um, they prevent flooding, they, they give us, um, you know, protection from storms, as well as being habitat for plants and animals, you know, so they're very important to us and we've lost a lot of them already. Prime Minister Andrew Holness had assured the nation that restoration work will be conducted in the area after mining and quarrying is done. But environmental advocate Peter Espute says there is no truth to the claim that the ecosystem in the area can be restored. I don't think there's any case in world history. You can't restore a natural ecosystem. A natural ecosystem is not just species, you know. We're not just talking about you bring in a botanist because there's one plant species that is at risk. That plant species exists inside an ecosystem with other plant species and animals. And if you dig it up and move the species somewhere else, you're not going to recreate what was there before. You remember that the ecosystems are dynamic. There's interaction between species and interaction between the species and the substrate, the actual physical environment. This is a myth that the economic development community has created, that there is something called restoration. There's no such thing. It doesn't exist. Another environmental advocate, Wendy Lee, launched a petition on the weekend calling for the Prime Minister to reverse the decision to allow quarrying and mining in the Dry Harbor Mountain. The petition also urges Mr. Holness to engage local stakeholders in a meaningful process to see the unique limestone forest ecosystem protected and managed as a habitat, conservation and research area. The petition, which aims to get 2,500 signatures, has gathered more than 1,600 signatures so far. Prince Moore, TVJ News. A new vaccine that protects against COVID-19 is nearly 95% effective, early data from U.S. company Moderna suggests. The early results come hot on the heels of similar results from Pfizer and add to growing confidence that vaccines can help end the pandemic. Both companies use the highly innovative and experimental approach to designing their vaccines. Moderna says it plans to apply for approval to use the vaccine in the next few weeks. However, this is still early data and key questions remain unanswered. The trial involved 30,000 people in the U.S. with half being given two doses of the vaccine, 
four weeks apart, the rest had dummy injections. Only five of the COVID cases were in people given the vaccine, 90 were in those given the treatment. The, va the company says the vaccine is protecting 95 point, well, 94.5%. With the country recording decreases in positive cases of the COVID-19 virus, there are expectations that there will be a relaxation of the measures for the Christmas holidays. However, one medical association is urging caution. O'Shane Masters has the details. The government is being cautioned not to ease COVID-19 restrictions for the Christmas season amid surges in cases in North America and Europe. President of a Medical Association of Jamaica, Dr. Andrew Manning, argues that the anticipated increase in visitors to the island during the period could lead to a surge in cases here as well. He says Jamaica is now at a critical juncture and caution must be exercised. We have a limited capacity in terms of our hospitals and the numbers of beds to deal with COVID patients and also to deal with the other persons in Jamaica with other health conditions. We are at a critical junction now and we cannot afford to have a new surge in cases over the Christmas season. So we would urge the government to look on this matter very carefully. And with projections that Jamaica could begin receiving doses of an approved COVID-19 vaccine by the end of March next year, Dr. Manning says Jamaicans should hold out a little longer before letting down their guard. We also need to consider the recent development with respect to the vaccine. That is cause for hope and it should strengthen our resolve to hold strain at this point until we can see the back of COVID-19. We but would not advise the government to ease the restrictions with the coming Utah season. The government is expected this week to announce whether COVID-19 restrictions will be eased for the Christmas season. Last month, Prime Minister Andrew Hone suggested they would be relaxed. Oshade Masters, TVJ News. Jamaica's COVID-19 case count is inching closer to the 10,000 mark. 45 new cases were recorded yesterday, pushing the tally to 9,929. Their ages range from 3 to 90 years. Meanwhile, the country's death toll remains at 231. No new deaths were recorded yesterday. The Ministry of Health says the number of persons hospitalized with the respiratory illness has increased to 88. Six of them are critically ill. Meanwhile, 11 million people have now tested positive for the coronavirus in the U.S. since the start of the pandemic. That's up more than 1 million cases in just six days. Sunday marked the 13th consecutive day that the country reported more than 100,000 new cases. Nearly 70,000 patients have been hospitalized with the virus. States are now rushing to set up new restrictions as hospitalizations skyrocket. It's now time for a break on the Midday News. Please stay with us. We'll have more stories when we return. Welcome back and we're continuing the news. Road safety experts are calling for a reduction in speed limits in school zones and stricter penalties for persons breaching the guidelines in these areas. It comes as yesterday, November 15, was recognized as World Day of Remembrance for Traffic Victims. Kirk Wright reports. It's the second highest cause of death in Jamaica, and for years, the country has exceeded the aim of below 300 road fatalities per year. 2019 saw a 30-year high of 440 fatalities, and while there have been few deaths on the nation's roads so far this year, Vice Chairman of the National Road Safety Council, Dr. Lucian Jones, says the less than 300 benchmark will be missed again. But the COVID restrictions has allowed for a reduction in the number of fatalities, but not to the extent that we would have hoped. August and September were disastrous months when over 40 people died for the, each month. It kind of slowed down in October and November. So far, we are probably running about one per day. So it would appear as if we are going to come in below the 440 last year. 
Today is recognized as World Day of Remembrance for Tragic Victims. This year's focus is on road safety for children. Between January 1 and November 8, 2020, 24 children were killed on Jamaica's roads. That is why UNICEF and the National Road Safety Council has been championing the X Marks the Spot Road Safety Project to promote safe school zones. We gathered research, we looked at where were accidents and injuries and deaths taking place, which schools were they near to, and we identified 10 for major infrastructural upgrades, and this began in 2018, and to date we've completed six. This means bus laybys, lifting the sidewalks, fixing the drainage, repainting the crosswalks, putting speed slow down strips on either side of the crosswalk. But with schools closed due to COVID-19, they're encouraging guardians to be vigilant and teach children about proper road usage. They're also calling for stricter recognition of safe school zones and a reduction in the speed limits in these areas. The speed limit is 30 kilometers per hour. What we're advocating is that that speed limit should drop even further to 15 kilometers per hour which is what happens in North America and all these other developing countries. And the same thing happens if you have construction going on. And the fines are doubled, by the way, in, in North America, if you exceed the speed limit around a construction zone, around a, a speed zone, or sorry, a, a, a school zone. You know you've seen school signs that tell you you're approaching a school. Sometimes they're hidden by trees. What we want is for those signs to be front and center, for slow down strips to be uh, available if possible. But most importantly, what is most sustainable is if our motorists know that they need to slow down because slowing down saves lives. They're hoping for stricter penalties for those who breach road safety guidelines, especially in school zones. Kirk Wright, TVJ News. There's an increase in the number of thieves on bikes taking out financial institutions and robbing individuals when they leave. Police say statements from victims of recent robberies have forced them to up their presence at some institutions and also target a certain group of bikers in vehicular checkpoint operations. Bikes and more bikes. It's not a yard sale, but these have been seized as part of a drive to rid the streets of thieves on bikes, described as a big problem for police. We find that persons are being tracked and trailed into their communities where they are set upon and robbed, as would have been evidenced recently by the incident in Avondale and other communities within this space. Um, we find that the motorcyclists, they come in, they attack and they make good their escape from the space using the predominantly the Yang Yang motorcycles. It's why the Commissioner of Police has given a directive to target persons on those motorcycles. In the meantime, the police are asking individuals to do their business online as much as possible. We encourage our people to resort to electronic means of transferring funds rather than taking actual cash. So rather than walking out of a financial institution with a large wad of cash, it is advisable that we do electronic transfer to the, to, to, the, to the business partners, whomever it is that we're transacting business with. Also, where one must travel with cash, it is advised that one pay attention, keen attention to the environment. That admonition, as reports from recent robberies indicate, that thieves are staking out financial institutions and targeting customers. On many occasions, we'd hear that um, an individual say that they probably were at a Western Union branch or they were at a branch of a financial institution, being a, a bank, and they would have observed a motor vehicle, a motor car, or a motorcycle, or they would have observed an individual. And then it so happens that when they were pounced upon at their gate or as they enter or disembark their motor vehicle. It happens to be the said motor vehicle which they earlier saw or the said person attired in the same shirt. Or the criminals are staking out at these institutions watching people we, is what you believe? We have reasons to believe so, yes. Based on the reports that we have received from our customers who have been victims of these robberies, yes. So, what are the police doing in response? The team embarks on visitation to these um, financial institutions. Also, we have up to the number of VCP operations that we do on the streets. We are more interrogating of the motorcyclists and the motor vehicles that fit the description of those that generally target the individuals. More schools could reopen in the coming weeks for face-to-face -face classes. 
Education Minister Favel Williams hinted at the possibility in an interview with TVJ News. Prince Moore has the details. Students and teachers are slowly returning to traditional classrooms and adjusting to new protocols. While handing over tablets to students at Belfield Primary in Manchester on Friday, Mrs. Williams says this two-week phase will be used to guide the minister's decision to determine which schools will participate in the next phase. As you can well imagine, right now we are assessing other schools to see how best we can bring those on. We're not just waiting until the end of the two weeks. You know, we're, we're actively um, seeing what, what are we learning? Um, are there things that we missed that for the next round we need to do better at? So we're getting that information already and we're trying to determine the next step even before we get to the end of the two weeks. So far, 17 schools are participating in the trial. Those schools in session now will continue with their face-to-face -face learning. In the meantime, although parents welcome the tablets, some continue to face challenges. I'm not having any problem with the tablets. I'm having problem with data because I have to use my phone. I'm not having Wi-Fi or anything. I have to use my phone with the data to connect to the tablet. With my connectivity, we have a connection, but at times, internet go on and off. When it's time for the kids to start class, it goes. So they hardly can get a chance to do their classes. Prince Moore, TVJ News. Minister Without Portfolio in the Ministry of National Security, Matthew Samuda, says discussions will be held with the relevant stakeholders to improve safety in the country's correctional facilities. This following a fatal stabbing of a correctional officer last Friday. Jamel Wesley was stabbed by an inmate on Friday morning during the cell unlocking process at the St. Catherine Adult Correctional Center. He later died while undergoing treatment at the Spanish Town Hospital. Mr. Samuda visited the facility this morning to give his support and sympathy to the staff. Myself, Dr. Chang, and even the Prime Minister who I spoke to a while ago stand with you this morning. And we certainly wish you all the best and we'll keep you in our prayers. And we won't just pray about it, we'll look at how we can improve situations that reduce your own, your own risks as you go about the, the very important job from the National Security Architecture. The correctional family is committed to the task. Um, we know it's a dangerous job. Um, we know once we come behind the walls, a lot of times the efforts and the intensity of the environment is not known. But here within the DCS family, we understand. Um, we are united to continue to be professional and rise above these situations. In sports, JFF General Secretary Dalton Winters confirmed testing positive for COVID-19 while in Saudi Arabia for the Reggae Boys 2 friendly international against the host nation. Winters is now the fifth confirmed case of COVID-19 in the Reggae Boys camp in Saudi Arabia. TVJ Sports caught up with Wint on Sunday. Yesterday I tested positive for the coronavirus. I have no symptoms and so far I'm doing well, thanks to the Almighty. I must say to all the well-wishers, a very big thank you and continue to pray. It's not only myself that is tested or was tested positive. We have other persons who were tested, so you know, keep them all in their prayers and hopefully we'll be back home soon. Three players and one member of the coaching staff were also notified of their positive results between Thursday and Friday. The Reggae Boys, who lost the first of their two friendlies on Saturday 3-0, will, will complete their assignment rather on Tuesday against the hosts. And that's the Midday News. I'm Giovanni Dennis. Join us at 7 for Primetime News. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, good afternoon.